Well, we're, we're, we're getting close, folks. We're going to be setting the emergency brake on this God of the Covenants here pretty soon. I, 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 it's funny because I, I stopped and thought, gee, am I going to remember how to teach anything else? What am I going to do? <laughs> so, hallelujah. So, as we go forth, you know, one thing that, that I'm hoping you guys are able to do, if you, if you think about the history aspect of, of Scripture, and of course we're still adding to the, the history of, of the body of Christ. It hasn't ended. Well, you and I are still the epistles taking place today. You know what I mean? It's, it's not ended, and so remember that. And so because of that, it's important that we know that God has chosen to bind himself to humanity through covenants. And we know that God is a covenant-making God and a covenant-keeping God. And, and, and because we're still in the history-making of the church, of the body of Christ, the covenant that he made is still just as powerful and just as essential for us as it has been for anybody else in all, in, in all of Christendom. The covenant is just as strong and just as effective today as it was the very first day it was made. It has not lost its power. Amen. And so um, last week we stopped. We ended talking about how the Pharisees saw God as a God who makes demands and requires that you keep all of the demands. See, and that was the problem with the laws. It was a list of demands that you had to keep in order to be blessed. And if you didn't keep them, you were cursed. Okay, you have to remember both sides of that. And, and so everything with the Pharisees had to do with external views and how things looked. How they looked to you and how you looked to them. That's how the Pharisees operated, okay? They wanted to know, well, were you keeping the demands that God has put on you? They want to see how you're doing. Um, and the better you keep God's demands, the more holy and righteous you are is what they believed. Once again, they thought righteousness was by right doing. And, of course, when you look at it through the lens of the law, there is some truth to that, okay? But remember, we're at this place right now where Jesus has been born. He's growing up, becoming a man. And so if you picture that moment in history where you have the law, Jesus was born under the law, and he taught under the law, Scripture tells us, okay? And, and it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's the 613 commandments was the law. Most people think there's 10. There was 613 by the time you have all the feasts and dietary and, and all of the laws. Um, and that's why it's so amazing when Scripture says that Jesus kept the law. He kept all 613 of them. Okay, so we're in this window of time now where Jesus is now starting to, to do the ministry of showing the Father, the true heart of the Father. Jesus said that he came to show us the Father. And what happens, if you look at the Father through the law, you see a very demanding Father, a God that's just demanding, demanding, demanding. But it's amazing we forget that before Mount Sinai, when the law was given, all of those people back to Abraham lived by grace. Because there was no law, there was no sin. Sin, the law is what shows you you're a sinner. Like I talked about the speed limit sign. You're driving down the road. You don't know what the speed limit is on that road. Once you see the sign, you look at your speedometer, you'll see I'm either sinning or I'm not. I either need to slow down or I can speed up. The, the, the sign, which was the law, showed you where you were at in all of that. And so then we see that Jesus... And most of the old covenant believers saw God to be a gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Well, think about those two viewpoints. What a different view of God. 
What a different way to approach God. One that's hard and harsh and demanding. If you don't do it right, you're in trouble. And the other one that's gracious and merciful and slow to anger and steadfast in love. And that comes out of Psalms 145.8. And so once again, like I said, everything the Pharisees dealt with was external. It was all about your doing. But Jesus came and the heart of God was seen in the heart of man. Jesus wants people to see that God wants to look at your heart. God is a God of the heart, not of a God of the external. That's why clothes to him doesn't matter, what you drive doesn't matter, where you live doesn't matter. It's the position that your heart is him towards him and towards his creation. See, it's both places God wants to know that our heart is towards those things. And the sad reality that we talked about last week was that churches and a lot of recovery groups deal with behavior modifications. What they want to do is they want to take off, for example, your, your alcohol-stained clothes and put new clothes on you and then try to deem you repaired. But the problem is you're not repaired internally. You're just repaired externally. And that's why a lot of times the failure rate in those groups is so high because you really haven't changed just your behavior. You've just modified your behavior, but your heart still wants to drink. Your body is still lusting after the drugs or the alcohol or the riotous living. And that's where God comes in and repairs us from the inside. But, the, but religion wants you to just, as long as you can make the outside look good, you're good with us. But on the inside, you're still dying. And God changes the heart, and the issues of life change. That's what Scripture said. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. And God is a God that changes the heart. In fact, Scripture tells us, in Ezekiel, that God took that stony heart that was, was hardened by sin and gave us a soft, pliable heart, a new heart that relates to God and God's love and God's compassion towards us. And so one of the things in my life as, as a believer and as a, a minister of the gospel is, unfortunately, in a lot of the years, as I was under the Grace Plus message and I looked at myself through the lens of how I was doing with God. So what that did is it caused me to look at others through that same lens. I was a Pharisee of nature. I was doing the same thing because I believe that's how God was viewing things. Okay? And, and the, the funny joke is I needed a pharisectomy. <laughs> I needed that pharisaical thought process cut off and, and the heart of God installed. And so one of the things now as I minister is when I see the fruit, whether it's alcoholism, drug-related, riotous living, whatever it may be, I look past that and I want to go to the root because I know that's where God's going to want to go. That's where the Holy Spirit wants to go. He wants to go to the root of the issue because if you can kill the root, you'll kill the fruit. See, behavior modification is looking at the apple tree and its, and its apples and running around and taking all the apples off and say, there, no fruit. Well, what's going to happen next season? It's going to grow fruit, see, because that's what apple trees do. It's a natural outpour of an apple tree. But if you can kill the root, you can kill the fruit. And I know that to be true, and here's why. So I've got a mulberry tree tree at my shop. When I bought that shop in 2001, it was little and I should have cut it off right then. But I didn't. And if you know anything about mulberries and birds, well, they eat the mulberries and then they sit on the fence line and then they distribute the seeds and, and now I have mulberry trees all along all of my fence lines. But guess what I've been doing? I've been going in and drilling a hole in it and putting this certain liquid in there. And guess where that liquid goes? To the roots. And guess what happens? I can wash it, and the green leaves are now starting to turn brown, starting to thing, and now they're dying. 
because I killed the roots. I got to cut them off, and the problem is I need to get rid The mulberry tree I have now is about the size of this building. It's just astronomical. It's crazy. I should, like I said, I should have cut it off. And, and that's really a good example in our life. When things start to rise up in our life, the time to deal with it is when it's little. You know, I told both my kids, I said, if you never drink alcohol, you'll never have a problem with it. Right? If you never do drugs, you'll never have a problem with them. All right? And it's just an absolute truth. But the nice part is, is when God comes in and plants this, the new seed in us, then we bear new fruit, good fruit, fruit of the Spirit, fruit that we like, fruit that people like around us. That's the amazing part is not only do we get to enjoy that fruit, the people around us enjoy it because we're not angry. We deal in love and, and joy and peace and we're long-suffering towards them. Amen. Um, and so we're at this place now where Jesus is out ministering, and, and it's so interesting when you look at the dynamics of his ministry because you have the Pharisees and the scribes and the law and the harshness that it is, and then you have the broken people that needed repair. And, of course, one thing we know is the hard, harsh law does not fix broken people. The law was given that sin might increase. The law... Scripture calls it a mirror, okay? And if you know anything about a mirror, when you go in and look in a mirror, it will tell you the state you're in. You ladies know that when you look in the mirror and you see lipstick on your teeth, that you don't want that there, all right? And, and I've learned through the years that I tell ladies, hey, you have lipstick on your teeth, because I know they'd want to know, okay? But the mirror can't get the lipstick off. It can only show you the problem. And that's what the law does, is it shows you that you fall short of the perfect nature of God, okay? And so here's Jesus dealing with all of that in his ministry. And I want to go to uh, Matthew 23. We're going to read verses 25 through 28. And this is, this is a couple of the woes that he proclaimed on the scribes and the Pharisees. There's seven of them that woe to you, um, I'll just read it, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may also be clean. Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites. Now think of this. He's talking to the religious leaders. And of course, they don't recognize him for who he is. They think he's just a man that's got this new ministry. And trust me, there were plenty of ministers, and there were a lot of bar Jesus or phony Jesus, as they called. And, and so now he's talking to these people, and he's speaking this way to them. Who dared to speak to a scribe or a Pharisee this way? Oh, my goodness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I mean... I'm sorry, but I, I'm picturing myself standing around this conversation taking place and Jesus saying these things to them. There isn't much worse that you could say to them other than call them a brood of vipers. You could, maybe that would, that's a pretty bad saying, okay? To tell them that they're unclean because that's one of the things that they strove diligently is to never be unclean. They, they were so proud that they, but the problem was, like a whitewashed tomb, they're only clean on the outside, okay? And we find Jesus dealing with the religious leaders who were to represent God to the people and how they were hypocrites. Remember, part of the law was, is it was that God's people were to represent him through this law, to show what type of God he was, okay? That he was a God of justice, but he was a fair God. 
And so now you have the Pharisees and the scribes, and of course the Pharisees were the teachers of the law, the scribes were the ones that wrote it down. They, they, they transcribed it and so on. And um, here they're being hypocrites to the, to the people. They're pro proclaiming themselves one way to the people, but yet not being that way in their real lives, okay? And um, they took care of what the people could see, and they took great pride in it. They strutted around with all of their garb and all that stuff that looked great on the outside, but neglected what God could see. See, and what God did in the person of Jesus Christ showed up and said, hey, let's open up this robe. Let's look on the inside. Let's see your heart. Where's your heart at towards these people? You're supposed to be representing God. Let's look at your heart. Oh, it doesn't look good in there. You look all wonderful on the white on the outside. You're all whitewashed and everything looks good, but on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones. I'm telling you that. That's why they tried to stone him and push him off cliffs and get rid of him, because he was revealing truth. And and here's the sad reality: is you, you would think that they would say. Holy smokes, he's right. But see, pride doesn't let you do that. Self-righteousness will not allow you to humble yourself. Because scripture says if you'll humble yourself before God, he'll lift you up. Jesus wasn't there to tear them down. He was there to put them in the place where they could represent God to the people correctly. Amen? And why do you think that the people left the, the Pharisees and started following Jesus? Well, does law sound better than love? Not anywhere I know of. And so, um, so they look good on the outside, but left the inside full of greed and self-indulgence. And Jesus was very harsh on their hypocrisy. He needed to jolt them into seeing where they were really at. And that's what the law was designed to do, was to be that mirror. At that point, Jesus was talking to them, and he's being the mirror. He's showing them their issues. Um, and how they might look good on the exterior or the outside, but the inside, the heart, uh, they were the highest level by the law of unclean. And see, that was one of the things that they prided themselves on. They were full of death and decay, a thing they tried so hard to avoid. It, it was just amazing how hard they would work at this, but yet not realizing that it was living on the inside of them. And that's a sad reality. Um, so we find Jesus using the law on the self-righteous in whatever form it was found. One thing I have come to realize is that grace and self-righteousness cannot coexist. Because what happens is grace gives the glory to, or excuse me, self-righteousness gives the glory to the person. Where grace gives the glory to God. That's really the difference, okay? And um, so um, you find as you read his ministry or you read about his ministry that he was never angry with sinners, only the self-righteous. And, it's, and it's, it's interesting when you look at that because remember right now we're, we're, we're in this transition period. Jesus is here. Grace and truth is here. Okay? The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So now grace and truth is here, and it's ministering the heart of the Father. It's showing the true heart of what Father, of what Father God wants to do for you in your life, okay? Um, but we find that the sad state of people trying to cleanse themselves by the keeping of the law, base covenant, does not work. It was what I talked about earlier. It's, it's, it's like playing hide-and-seek with somebody that's not in the house. You can't find it in the law. You cannot find righteousness in the law. You know why? Because God never intended it to be in there. 
The law was to bring us to Christ, to bring us to a right standing with God. That's what the law was designed to do. And once you and I as a believer come to that position, it talks about in Galatians how the tutor, the one that, that raised up the, the Jewish uh, infant, is now released. You and I no longer relate to God through the law. We re relate to God through the Holy Spirit. We relate to God now instead of being an employer, employee, which was what kind of what the law represented, as now a child to a father. That's our relationship now. Now, instead of having to go to a high priest and having the blood shed from the animal and him taken into the Holy of Holies on your behalf, you and I now can walk right into the Holy of Holies because of our position. You and I can run right into the Father's den in the middle of a Zoom call with his employer and jump up on his lap. You know, I had a situation in my shop years ago when Brianna was just little, and I took her down there on a Saturday morning, and, and it was funny. They used to play with these little chips of Formica, and I had a little stick with a, with a rope and a little paper clip on the bottom like a hook, and they would put them in this old metal grate, and then they would fish them out of there. They just, she, I had this gentleman that was a customer of mine. Uh, actually, it was a customer that I was doing work for, came in, crotchety old guy, and he said something about my daughter being there. I threw him out. Amen. I threw him out. <laughs> because I told him, she will be here long after I'm done with your job, pal. And I don't need you. And you can just leave right now. So he went and called the contractor that I was working through, and the contractor said, yeah, that was a dumb move on your part, pal. You know, and, and that's what we have to understand is that's our new relationship with God. But the best you can do in religion or using the law is whitewash yourself. And unfortunately, a lot of the people we run across, they, they have made a decision for Christ. They're born again, but unfortunately, they're still in the mindset that I used to be in, that I had to, to finish off my salvation, okay? I had to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Well, that is scriptural. It's in the Bible. But what it means is to work it out of you. It's like working a potato out of the ground, okay? And, and all that God is is in me, all the gifts and the talents and the abilities. And, and it's up to me now to understand who I am in Christ and, and allow them to come out. I work them out, okay, with reverence and awe. And, uh, and so all we can do is make ourselves look good on the outside while dying on the inside. And, and that's the sad reality of people that don't understand this grace message is, is they go around... God, I remember the years we did this. You know, it's like you'd pull up to church or pull up to some Christian meeting and you'd dig in the glove box and get out your mask and go in the meeting and praise be God, I'm the victor, I'm the head, not the tail. And, and the whole time on the inside, you're just hurt and wounded and needed help. And then you'd go in and you hear a message that would tell you how bad you're doing and how you need to get your act together and straighten yourself up so God will be pleased with you and you actually left feeling worse than you came in. Like, dang, that was hardly worth it. And then I had to give them 10% of my money to hear that. <laughs> Crap. You know? And, and so it's sad that a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ right now are wounded and don't know how to get out. And you and I, through this message of grace, of the finished work of Christ, have their answer. You know, sometimes we forget that Believers need to be ministered to, too. Not just the lost and dying. It's believers that are hurting. Um, and like Scripture says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And that's really should be our goal as ministers of the gospel is to go in and release the chains, whatever they may be, yeah. off of the people. You know, you may have somebody that was bound up both arms and legs and they've got the two arms and one leg free, and that's better than all four being bound up, but it's not what Jesus paid for. Jesus paid for you to be completely free, amen? Um, 
And so what it made me think of, as I was thinking about it, made me think of the rich young ruler in Mark 10. Of course, he comes to Jesus and says, hey, a good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, of course, what did Jesus pull out? He pulled out the law because he said, what must I do? What's my job in all of this? Well, you have to keep these commandments. I've done all these things since my youth. Does that sound self-righteous? I'm good at this. I can do this. And so he said, hey, all right, well, because I know your heart, you've got a heart problem. Your money means more to you than God does. You've broken the first commandment. You've got a God bigger than God. It's your money. He said, hey, go sell all that you have, give it away, and come follow me. And it says he went away sad. See, the law revealed his heart. The problem was he wasn't willing to repent and change the way he thinks. He said, yeah, you know what? All this stuff means nothing. And Tim was talking about it during work. All this stuff really means nothing in the light of the kingdom of God and, and of salvation, of a freedom. Um, let's go to Mark 10. I want to read a scripture out of Mark 10. Uh, verse 17, looks like I need here. Yep. Oh, excuse me, that's, that was, that's what I just talked about, about the rich young ruler. Um, and so that Jesus reveals that he has a problem through the law. Um, and I've always noticed that someone that came to Jesus in self-righteous mode, he gave them the law. Funny, when you go through now and read the Gospels, you will see these two sides of how Jesus dealt with people. Anybody that came to him in a self-righteous mode like the rich young ruler did, he gave him the law. And sometimes he gave him the law on steroids. He, he would say some degree, well, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder but I'm going to tell you the, the real heart of the law is if you've even hated somebody, you've already committed murder. And you've heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I tell you the real heart of that law is if you've even lusted after a woman, you've already committed adultery. And he brought the law up to the full strength that it was designed to be from the very beginning to show you you fall short. You're not making it. It's, it's not going to work for you. Um, but when they came to Jesus and, and basically hands were empty, said, I have nothing to give, but I have a servant at home that's sick. Would you come to the house and heal him? Said, I tell you what, you just go ahead and go on your way, and by the time you get home, he'll be healed. And he's walking home, and another servant came running up to him, said, hey, fellow servant's been healed. Mother comes and says, hey, my son is dying. Raises him up. Goes to Peter's house. Raises Peter's. Everybody that came to Jesus with, I have nothing to offer. He gave them grace and mercy. Every one of them. Every single one of them. So remember now, we're, we're in this transition where the law is the the strength of the day. They're living in the law, but he's trying to transition the people into seeing the true heart of God. He's trying to get them to repent, which the word means to change the way you think or, or change the direction you're going. And, and so um, that's what he's trying to get them to do. But the Pharisees and the scribes said, no, the law is where it's at. And the most amazing part is, is those were the ones that studied the law, studied the Torah, studied the Pentateuch. They should have been the first ones to recognize. Wait a minute. Born of a virgin, born in a manger, born in, you know, Nazareth. This is the guy, according to all of the prophecies, but they didn't see him. They, the law was their stumbling block. Um, and so they realized what Jesus said in Isaiah 61 in the temple that first day, that he came to set the captives free. He came to release those that were bound. Okay, and that's what he was doing. Um, and so self-righteousness 
is still an issue we all deal with from time to time. It just is. You know why? Because we want to matter. We do. We want to matter. Why? I mean, it's, it's a natural thing for us to want to matter. Okay? I still say that when sin entered in the garden, the, the, the natural fissure in the human existence was self. Because think of what happened with Adam and Eve. They're, they're enjoying their time in the garden. Sin entered the garden. The first thing happened is they became aware of themselves. They saw that they were naked. They'd never noticed that before. They'd probably noticed all of the beauty of the garden, all that God had created, and now because of sin, self was front and center. You know, and that's why people tell me, well, man wrote the Bible. I said, there ain't no man going to write, you need to die to yourself and live to others. Amen? It's a message you hardly ever hear preached out of Scripture. It says the, the greatest among you is who? The servant of all. See, that's not a natural man thought process. But Scripture also tells us that if you'll humble yourself in the sight of God, he will exalt you. And when he exalts you, there's no puffiness. You're not headstrong. It, it's a, it's a, a place that you're there to help others, not yourself. See, that's one of the amazing thing about God is that he can exalt you in the proper manner and you don't become self-righteous. But it's interesting because we have watched people that God has exalted that have went away from the truth of Scripture and exalted themselves. And, and pride comes before the fall. Amen. But you know what the funny part is, is, is you know, we talked about it, and Ginny says it quite often, is when we, we see some man of God, woman of God, and they, they're all of a sudden revealed that there's some big sin in their lives. Uh, they've fallen from grace is normally what you hear. But actually the reality is they're fallen into grace. They're, they're finally realizing that, yes, they too are sinners, and yes, they too fall short, and yes, grace is still sufficient for what they have need of. Amen? And I just love it. And so between the world, the flesh, and the devil, we need to be on guard for the puffing up of self-righteousness or the other side of the fence, because the devil will get you on both sides of the fence. He's tricky that way. Um... Or the beating down of, I'm not good enough. See, that's the, self, that's the sad reality of self-righteousness. It does one of two things. It either puffs you up and makes you think that you're somebody super special. Or it will drag you down because you're not living the way you're supposed to and make you feel that you're a substandard human being. That's what self-righteous, it, it, he, he's always trying to get you to one of those two places. And one of the things you find out about being exalted to a high place is you can fall, okay? But the Holy Spirit will bring you to that place where Jesus is exalted, amen? The Father is exalted, the Holy Spirit is exalted, and you're just thankful that they're allowing you to be a part of what they're doing. And when you keep that mindset, you realize that, but for grace, there goes me. I can be that person also. And so, uh, you know, we have to guard ourselves from that because he can't change your and my salvation. Okay, you are saved and sealed and eternally set forth for heaven. But he can make our life and our Christian experience down here just miserable if we let him. If we don't understand the truth of the grace message and how the same grace that saves you is the same grace that will sustain you through your Christian walk. Amen. Because we have this tendency that we're saved by grace and then somehow we think we need to finish it off. You know, it's like my wife baked the, baked the uh, cherry cheesecake and I have to come in and put the frosting on the top. When Jesus said it was finished, it was finished. He had done all that God demanded for salvation. 
And you and I now get to yield to what the Holy Spirit's doing in our lives and allow him to be the person that, that endues us with the wisdom and the energy and the words and all that we need to walk out our lives. Amen? And, um, and, and you have to realize that being puffed up or being deflated, one is just as bad as the other. Because God's not going to be exalted in either of those places. If people see you puffed up, it repels them. And as you and I both know, when people see us downcast, they also are repelled from that. Amen? It's just not a good place to be. So now we find Jesus dealing with keeping all the law, but still extending grace and mercy. So remember, Jesus kept all the law, 100% of it. So he's walking out his ministry, fulfilling all of the law, okay, and, and so on. So if we go to John, I'm going to quickly run through this. Uh, the book of John, we find kind of a, a very well-known passage that most of us would know, John 8, 1. Um, and, of course, it's, it's the woman caught in adultery. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote in with his finger in the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Jesus is now finally going to speak. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Uh-oh. At once, oh, uh, and, and once more he bent down and rolled on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Okay? So it's interesting. Jesus is now has to fulfill the law. If he does not fulfill the law perfectly, he cannot be your and my Savior. Okay? So he's in this dynamic now. So picture this, he's, he's, he's in the temple courts, and he's got people around, he's teaching. And they come smoking in there, the scribes and the Pharisees, with this woman that's been caught in the act of adultery. Throws her on the ground in front and says, hey, we caught her in the act of adultery, and the law says, what do you say? And, and um, that had to be quite a time for the people. I mean, could you imagine if somebody came in here right now in that situation and threw some woman possibly completely naked, right up here in front of us, and said, hey, the law says, and we're like going, what is going on here? But they were trying to test Jesus. The law of Moses commands, and there's still a lot of people today that say that thing. What do you say, grace preacher? Basically what they said, hey, listen, you're running around preaching grace and mercy, but the law of Moses says, and you know what? The law of Moses did say. It was true. Um, don't kid yourself. This stuff still happens today. There's, there's religious settings where this still happens today. Not so much the woman caught in adultery, but people come and say, all right, grace preacher, what do you say about this situation? This person's been caught stealing from the coffers of the church. And the law says, thou shalt not steal. What do you say, grace preacher? And, and, and it's interesting because we get accused of being light on sin, but that's not so. We are just heavy on Jesus. Amen? It's one of those things where we look to the heart of God, his grace, his mercy, his compassion, and his love in the situation. You know, they, they accuse us of saying, well, you, you just let people just sin all they want. No, because we believe that the work of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit is greater than that sin. 
And a sinner doesn't need to know they're a sinner. They already know they're a sinner. A sinner doesn't need to be condemned and made to feel guilty. They already condemned and need to be made feel, uh, feel guilty. You and I need to bring the gospel, the good news, into the situation. It's not that we're light on sin. We're just heavy on Jesus. Amen. The work of the cross and the trap was set. What would Jesus do? Let her go and break the law or stone her? And I love it because Jesus stoops down and writes in the sand and they press him on the question. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? And finally, Jesus stands up and says, hey, listen, let any of you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. I love it because they all knew on the inside they've got issues. They've got things they're dealing with. There's things that aren't right between them and God according to the law. Because they can't keep it, we can't keep it. It's just how it is. It wasn't designed to be kept. And then he bends back down and returned to writing in the sand. And, and I've heard it said, and it may be, what he was writing in the sand might have been their name and the sin. All right, Pharisee Bob. <laughs> lust. All right, Pharisee Jim. You have hatred. All right, you know. And, and, and one by one, the accusers walked away. And I love it. It's, it's in there for a reason, guys. The oldest to the youngest. The oldest to the youngest because the oldest recognize it quicker. That You know what? I've been dealing with this deal for a long time. I'm out of here. Boom. Rock down. Bye. The youngest are going, yeah, I'm still a pretty good person. And finally they left. And uh, um, I believe they were still there. So I'm, I'm picturing this now, this whole thing, and now the accusers are gone, but it never really tells us, but I think that the crowd was still there, the one that he was teaching. I don't believe they left. I bet they were like, let's see what goes on here. And I believe they were still there to see Jesus extend grace and mercy and forgiveness and the gift of no condemnation because we know the Pharisees weren't going to deliver that, Okay. So Jesus is now starting to show the heart of the Father. The Pharisees showed the external. Here's a woman caught in adultery. Of course, where's the man at? He was just as guilty. They didn't bring him. They just brought her. So in the reality of justice, if they were going to really keep the law to a tenth degree, the man should have been there also. But remember what he called them? Hypocrites. And, 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 you know, we realize in John 3.17, a scripture we hardly ever hear. You'll hear it in this place, but you hardly, of course, we all know John 3.16. God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world that the world might be saved through him. But John 3.17 says God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Here's a, here's a micro of this happening right here with this woman. Jesus was there not to condemn her, but to save her. And also one thing we have to remember is Jesus' instruction, go and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more. You know, and even in ours, we need to hear that. If we're struggling with things, we have to understand that we do have the gift of no condemnation, Romans 8.1. But I'm telling you, your life will be much better if you go and leave that sin. Because that sin is an anchor in your life. And the reason he wants you to leave it is because he knows it's an anchor in your life. Now, you and I may still find value in whatever it is, but he knows there's a greater value waiting for you if you'll lay it down, if you'll just let it go. And so we see Jesus starting to reveal the new covenant to come, this new covenant of grace and in him, sin would be removed and grace and mercy would be replaced, would replace guilt and shame and condemnation. God would make a way of escape. And see, we see that in this, in this passage with this woman caught in adultery. Jesus made a way of escape. He kept the law. He said, listen, y'all want to start throwing stones? There she is. See, he, he was not opposed to the stoning of the woman he just set a standard. He just set the heart of God that those of you that are without sin, 
go ahead and chuck the stone. And the amazing part is there's one person there that could have thrown the stone. It was Jesus. He was without sin. But he's the one that gave her the gift of no condemnation. And I'm telling you, that is one of the greatest things that will allow you to set sin down and walk away from it, knowing that God is not condemning you in it. it it's an amazing, it's like a reverse psychology thing, where if somebody says, well, yeah, just do that, do that, and it's like, well, I don't want to do that now if I'm told to do it. Kind of a weird deal. It's just a human psychic is in that way. And, and so today as we end, next week we're going to look at um, Jesus dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees again. And, and we're going to look at a scripture that I think is just monumental in its, in its dynamic. Okay? So come next week, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're landing the plane. The landing gear is down. We're, we're getting ready to ride right into this new covenant. And then we're going to look at what that new covenant is, what you and I have been given in the new covenant. Amen? Father, we thank you today for the gift of no condemnation. I thank you today. You're working on our hearts. We open up our hearts to hear from you and receive from you. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to work in our hearts. Those things that we're holding on to and, and we just find value in and we think we can't do without, but yet they're... They're literally holding us back from being all that you've called us to be. We relinquish to you right now. I thank you that, that your ability to go in with that wonderful gray scalpel and, and cut that stuff away from us without hurting us or wounding us or, or injuring us is so amazing as we just allow ourselves to be on that, that potter's wheel as you mold us and make us into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I bless my brothers and sisters. I thank you that they are the head and not the tail. They're above and not beneath, and everything they set their hands to prospers this week through the precious blood and the work of the cross and the redemptive act of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. If anybody needs prayer, please come and let us pray for you. Um, remember, 2 o'clock with Elaine if you're so moved to go there. And um, if you have questions about that, come see me. Amen. Johnny, looking good.